Hello, everyone. It's me, Billy Younger, again. Uh, I usually put this at the end of my first lecture uh, in my classes when I teach physics, or excuse me, when I teach astronomy face-to-face, uh, -face. and therefore I thought it was on one of my videos uh, where I did the self-addressed envelope. Turns out that I left that part off of the self-addressed envelope uh, video, so I thought I'd go ahead and just give you a little rundown on, on how we suggest the Big Bang uh, and stars in general could allow us to get where we are today. So uh, I want to go ahead and do that. It turns out that in 1905, Einstein uh, offered a special theory of relativity, which basically said the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. And that inertial word is the key point there. Basically, what he's saying is anything that appears to uh, any reference frame that appears to obey uh, Newton's first law of motion, an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force. So anything that appears to be obeying that law, which is also Galileo's law of inertia, is an inertial reference frame. And that actually excludes gravity, because if you imagine looking at just a film footage of, uh, for instance, the planet Earth uh, from far away where you can see the Earth and the sun, uh, you can't see if an actual force between the sun and the Earth, yet the Earth is not keeping a straight line. It's actually curving. So Einstein would have treated that as an, uh, a non-inertial reference frame. Uh, 1915, he actually was able to publish the general theory of relativity, which said the laws of physics are the same for all observers, got it, getting rid of the word inertial. Uh, he had actually found a way to uh, render the equations of physics, basically, is his field equations in uh, tensorial form so that they basically transform and always look the same no matter what coordinate system they're in. But he had gotten rid of the idea of it happened to be an inertial reference frame. And the equations were just yelling at him, telling him that if gravity, uh, well, if matter existed in the universe, which clearly it does, then gravity would actually cause possibly the universe to collapse, and, you know, shrink. Uh, of course, if there wasn't enough mass, it would cause it maybe to uh, expand or something like that. But what he was focused on was the fact that gravity would probably make the universe uh, contract, so he introduced his uh, cosmological constant, which he later called the great, greatest mistake, mistake of his life. That cosmological constant was in some sense something that we uh, he could use as a force that was causing the universe to stay static as he thought the universe was at the time. In the intervening period, a guy by the name of Alexander Friedman and another guy by the name of uh, Lemaitre, George Lemaitre, who was a Jesuit priest, uh, both independently uh, analyzed Einstein's uh, equations and found that the universe should, in fact, be expanding. And in fact, Friedman said that it was as if the universe started off as a primordial atom. Uh, that was the first hypothesis of the Big Bang, and it was coming from a Jesuit priest, and it was uh, coming from Einstein's general theory of relativity. Uh, we had no evidence of that, and Einstein uh, evidently told him, your, your mathematics is correct, but your physics is abominable. And that was some of the stuff that was covered in the video that I do in my first day of class, Beyond the Big Bang, uh, which is the season finale of season one of the universe series. So uh, you can put all this stuff together really uh, by watching that that entire movie, which is great. And like I said, I show it to my students at least once every semester. So, uh, I would like to show it three or four times, but you can watch that and get all this information. But one of the key aspects you don't get uh, from it, unless you really think all about it a lot, is how did life come to be and how do we get where we are today? And that's uh, that's a little harder to put together from the movie, even though they give you all the facts and all the details. It's just hard to put together. So that's what I'm trying to get at today. Well, it turns out Hubble, uh, using a, a new technique that had just been discovered, basically CFIAD variables acting as a, a standard uh, candle. So they had a, a, a standard amount of light that a CFIAD variable would put out. And if you actually watched and measured the period of that CFIAD variable, uh, it could tell you the total luminosity of the star. Having known the total luminosity and always being able to measure the brightness, you could then tell, away, tell how far away the star was. So that was a new way of finding distances. And he used that to find the distance to the Andromeda Nebula at the time. It wasn't yet understood to be a galaxy. And he discovered that it was, in fact, a galaxy as opposed to uh, a nebula. Uh, so it turned out to be a galaxy that was too far away for it to be part of us. And all of a sudden, he realized there was these islands of stars. And when he started to study more and more of those islands of stars, it became obvious that if a star was, or excuse me, if a, a island of stars, i.e. a galaxy, 
was 100 parsecs away, it would be moving away from us. If it was 200 parsecs away, it would be moving away from us twice as fast as the 100 parsec one. If it was 300 parsecs away, uh, it would be moving three times as fast as the 100 parsec one. And the only way we can really explain that is by uh, the universe itself expanding. Okay, that's what the Big Bang is. The Big Bang is not space existing as this, you know, emptiness with nothing in it. And then there's an explosion out of this one little spot and, and matter comes out. That's, that's what a lot of people think the Big Bang is, and it's not at all. Uh, the Big Bang is that nothing existed as far as we know. And the universe itself, which includes all the matter, all the energy, all the dark matter, all the dark energy, uh, and the space itself, all of that is included in the universe. And that was created in the Big Bang. So out of nothing, and far as we know, into nothing, blew space. And space had everything that would ultimately uh, lead to the to what we are at currently, which is a, a you know a galaxy filled with, uh, or excuse me, a universe filled with galaxies and stars and nebulas and clouds and interstellar uh, gas and stuff like that. So that's what the Big Bang really is. It's the space itself expanding, and and literally that's the only way we can explain that that observation of Hubble when things are you know forty times as far away, they move forty times as fast as things that are you know one time far away. So uh, Hubble now had evidence to show that Lemaitre and Friedman were correct. And that was when Einstein made the conclusion that putting in the cosmological con constant was the greatest blunder of his life. Uh, we now use that cosmological constant specifically to help us measure things like dark energy and dark matter and stuff like that, uh, in some sense, uh, basically more of a dark energy thing. But anyways, that, uh, that was what he was talking about. But I just wanted to point out that the the cosmological constant is now useful in physics again, but for that other reason. So when you actually start to study stars, uh, you learn that towards the end of the life of a star, uh, most stars don't have any kind of circulation system that takes the matter from inside the core where it's hottest and therefore high enough temperature for nuclear fusion to take place. Most of the regular mass stars don't have any kind of circulation system that uh, exchanges gas with the outer parts from the inner parts. So whatever hydrogen you have in the core, that's your fuel. Okay, if you get down below, I think it's around 0.4 solar masses, somewhere around there and smaller then yeah, they have a circulation mechanism and that's great. Uh, so they can circulate the hydrogen in and out. But above that, there's not much of that. And then I think there's another island uh, at the high end of the mass spectra where you can actually have some circulation as well. But in general, stars don't have a circulation system. So when they start to run out of hydrogen in the core, uh, weird things happen. So if you can imagine the core, has all this radiation it's putting out because hydrogen, four of them, four protons basically, are in some sense spontaneously becoming a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons. The mass difference there multiplied by C squared in the famous E equals MT squared equation gives the amount of energy uh, per reaction. Okay, it also gives us some neutrinos and uh, some positrons and stuff like that. But the main thing is that total energy, uh, total mass difference, when you multiply that by C squared, you get the energy that's put out by one of those reactions. And that's each time a hydrogen, uh, four hydrogens come together to make a helium uh, nucleus. And that's what's going on in the core. But as the core starts to run out, then gravity, the force that's pulling in on everything, starts to compress the core. And uh, if it's massive enough, then it'll actually press it so far that it'll reach the next critical temperature scale, which the 10 million Kelvin mark was where uh, hydrogen can fuse in the helium. Uh, but if you reach 100 million Kelvin, then helium can fuse in the carbon and, and some other things. So if you got enough mass, then you can actually uh, call the next generation of fusion that creates some other elements. So you start off with the Big Bang, which really only created hydrogen and helium. It's uh, trace amounts of lithium, beryllium, and uh, boron maybe, but that's, a, that's about it. So basically, if we're saying this universe was created by the Big Bang, and we see all these elements beyond hydrogen, helium, and even trace amounts of lithium, beryllium, and boron, then we've got a real issue. We, we've got some explaining to do. So where did that other mass come from? And that's what I'm talking about with these stars. When uh, you run out of hydrogen, you can start fusing helium that was left over into carbon and actually some other things come out of that too, I think oxygen. Uh, and then when that one runs out, some other things can come. And in the end, if the star is really massive enough, it'll go through several different types of 
of fusion and it ends up making sort of like a gobstopper. So you'd have like, you know, the, the core of the latest thing it can fuse, uh, maybe silicon into iron, okay? Uh, and that's in the very center. And then outside of that is the last thing it fused as a little shell. And outside of that is the last thing before that. And outside of that's last. And then if it's still massive enough, it'll explode in a supernova explosion. That distributes all those elements around. The galaxies can mix that up as well with their uh, density waves going through and actually cause that matter to be distributed over large places. Uh, when that's the case, now you've got the elements necessary for life. Uh, they use the phrase chin ops or something like that. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, potassium, and uh, sulfur, I think. Uh, but those are the uh, elements that are necessary for life. And of course, you need those if you're going to have life. But the problem is this. It turns out those high mass stars do everything way faster than the low mass stars. So they live in, the, in that extreme case, they live only maybe 10 million years. Uh, 10 million years is a lot of time, but that's not enough time for evolution to take place. So it's almost as if we left, uh, we were left by some giant creator or whatever, some extra capacity to get what we needed. We needed life. Well, we need something that's going to supply a source of energy for evolution to take place. And that's going to take billions of years. So the high mass stars give us elements that can be used to create life. But without the low mass stars, we can't uh, create any appreciable life. We could probably do, you know, single cell organisms and stuff like that. But more complex life leads, needs long times of evolution. And it just so happens that low mass stars do that. For instance, our star being a one solar mass will live about 10 billion years old. And the lower mass stars, some of them live for 100 billion years old. You know, the galaxy is only about 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. So a lot of stars uh, have never even died uh, and they were born in the very first instance after, right after the Big Bang. So the, the answer to one of the common questions is uh, how did we get to where we are right now uh, where life exists and we have complex life and, and the, the answer to that is multifold. We have to have a Big Bang that creates a universe. Uh, we build from a bottom up to make basically stars that form galaxies, that form galaxy clusters and groups and neighborhoods and stuff like that. Uh, and then ultimately that's all inside of our universe. But without that, without the stars living their life, we wouldn't have the elements that are necessary. So that's where the nuclear fusion comes in, supernovas uh, in fact counting for part of the matter that we didn't make on the way up through going through all those processes with the high mass stars. That gets us the elements, but again, we have no way to get the life here. So once we consider, well, how did the life get here? Uh, one of the principles of physics is the anthropological principle, which basically says whatever it takes to get life here, uh, if it really is required to get life here, then it must have happened. And in that sense, we can use the anthropological principle to say, well, we must have had something that could have made the things that we need for life. And it turns out in this case, the thing we needed was the low mass stars so that they could be a supply of energy. Because you've probably heard people say before that evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. Well, it doesn't because the second law of thermodynamics does say disorder increases or entropy increases uh, for a closed system. But if you have a planet and you have a sun heating up that planet, that's no longer a closed system. That's a system where energy is coming in and that energy which could have came from the sun. Later, we're starting to see it maybe comes from sub, uh, from thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, stuff like that. But the main thing is you have to have an energy source that could last a long period of time. And that long period of time could be billions of years. And in order for us to have that, we have to have low mass stars. So we've got the low mass stars uh, that actually uh, allow evolution to take place so that complex uh, life can exist. We've got the high mass stars that live their life and create the elements necessary, for instance, carbon. Uh, humans, for instance, we do need iron. Iron is the end of the uh, fusion chain in the high mass stars, stuff like that. So those come from the high mass stars. And then we also need galaxies because galaxies with their pressure waves can take those supernova explosions, the interstellar media and, and all those uh, different elements and sort of stir all that around so that we can actually get uh, the matter created by these stars and the supernovas uh, distributed more or less uniformly so that other stars can create nebulas that then become uh, star systems and therefore solar systems and ultimately can lead to life. 
So I hope that helps you uh, understand better a little bit about uh, what I'm saying about how uh, low mass stars fit into the equation of life, if you will. So anyways, I will call it a day. I hope you enjoyed it.